Hey, uh, before we get into the video, I've got some quick channel announcements to go over. First, as you'll notice if you quickly look below the video, we've crossed the 1k threshold, which is amazing, and I'm grateful that y'all enjoy the content, so thank you. I should somewhat soon be posting a 1k special, and this is where you come in. In the pinned comment, there's a link to a Q&A where you can submit any questions you might have. All of them will be answered in the 1k special, so now's your chance to learn things about me. We've gotten a few responses so far, but the more the merrier, right? Anyways, thank you for watching my content as always, and let's get back to your irregularly scheduled programming. Warning: This episode is going full speed ahead into spoiler territory for the Magnus Archives. I'm talking about spoiling basically everything in the show here, so if you have any intention of listening to it, which you should if you haven't already, bookmark this page and book it out of here so you can enjoy the series in its true glory. Also, this episode is going to feature in-depth discussions of fear, in particular as they relate to meat, body dysmorphia, cannibalism, and efficient factory lines. As a result, viewer discretion is advised. Oh, and a massive thank you to the Magnus Archives wiki, which was very useful in getting the info for this video together. Hey y'all, I'm Afton G here, and welcome back to the only channel where the G stands for Gluttonous Cannibals. I know it's a little late into the month for this, and on top of that, it's been a while since the last video, but I figure there's nothing better to come back with than Entities Explained. In the world of the Magnus Archives, there exist 15 eldritch fear gods, which manifest in many ways. Over the majority of the past year, I've worked to break down each of them in turn, with this being the 10th episode in this series. If you want to start at the beginning, there should be a link in the iCard now on your screen. Anyways, consider subscribing if you want to join the over 1,000 people now supporting the channel, and let's dig into a relatively new fear, because today, we're talking about the flesh. The Flesh, known in the early drafts of the series as Viscera, is sort of a complicated entity. Much like the Hunt, the Flesh is a primarily animalistic fear, driven by the terror felt by the many animals in the food industry. Because it's so reliant on mass farming, the Flesh is the newest fear, with one possible exception, truly coming into its own during the Industrial Revolution. The Flesh isn't a fear that humanity would have much reason to feel, so when you try to apply it to people, well, it gets weird. Yes, it still retains its themes of consumption, often taking the form of cannibalism, but it also deals in the mutilation and reconstruction of the human form. Too much, too little, too large, too small, it basically recombines people into terribly unfamiliar piles of meat. As you might expect, this also plays into bodily insecurities, and the desire to achieve a more perfect form. Beyond that, the flesh obviously manifests with meat and muscle tissues, but also with bones and entire bodies. If it's a part of a person, the flesh could probably manifest with it. The flesh also has many religious ties, specifically to Christianity. Bibles and prayers find their way into the works of viscera, as do references to early Christian history and even an entire church. So. Yeah, it's a weird one, but that's just gonna make it more fun to talk about. The avatars of the flesh are many and varied, so it looks like I've got my work cut out for me. By leaps and bounds, the most present character associated with the flesh is Jared Hopworth, also known as the Bone Turner. After interacting with a Lightner that we'll talk about later, Jared gained the ability to manipulate flesh and bone, which he used to make his entire body into a temple. A multi-armed, massive, extra-organ temple to an eldritch abomination, but a temple nonetheless. Jared led a very fulfilling life, from running a gym for the desperate to handling bodies for the Mafia, but eventually he got to live out his gardening dreams in the post-change world, turning people into beautiful and slightly horrifying bone plants. Unfortunately for him, though, he happened to be in the way of the young world's new god and his plus one, so of course, Jared got vaporized. Crossing the pond and jumping back to the days of the Oregon Trail, we find Eustace Wick, a cannibal who disguised himself as a guide, leading Benjamin Carlyle and his unnamed wife into a cave to kill them. While Eustace managed to slice Ben's throat, 
The wife shot him in the head before he could move on to the second course. The reason I mention Benjamin Carlyle is because his family line may have continued to be cursed by the flesh. In Mag 18, The Man Upstairs, Toby Carlyle is a hermit who tends to keep to himself and his hobbies, namely nailing flesh to every surface of his home. As you might expect, that much meat juice isn't good for a building. So Toby's rotten corpse was eventually discovered after causing enough of a stink to rile up the downstairs neighbor. In the room with him, though, may have been a living meat creature, although we never see it again, so it's pretty safe to say that whatever it was, it's gone now. The Han family are next up on the list, so let's start with John Han, because there weren't enough Johns in this show. John Han ran a fast food restaurant for a good while, but was eventually revealed as a cannibalistic murderer, with rumors circulating that he had served the flesh of his slaughtered wife in his dishes. Tom Han, his nephew, was relatively tame by comparison, working in a slaughterhouse until one day everything went to hell and he wound up getting shot in the head with a bolt gun. Originally, they were going to have some connection to Mag-5, thrown away, which does suit their seeming ability to duplicate items, but that idea also seems to have been scrapped somewhere down the line. Speaking of confusing Season 1 things, it's unclear what entity or entities orchestrated the downfall of Father Edwin Burroughs, but given the heavy religious imagery and focus on the cannibalizing of innocent victims that he experiences during his intense hallucinations, I'd say the flesh was involved. Next up is Angela, who I thought was an avatar of the web on my first listen, but nope, John makes it clear in Season 5 that she serves Viscera. Angela was apparently able to curse people, sending them boxes with a part of their body that they would soon lose in an accident of some type, taking the person apart piece by gory piece. Beyond that, there's also the unnamed ruler of the processing line domain post-change, and some lady with backwards-facing arms. Oh, and while not exactly a character, I feel like it would be a sin not to mention Monster Pig. Monster Pig was a giant pig who just showed up one day on a farm, ate a clown, and then got buried in cement. We all love Monster Pig. The Flesh is an entity with a fair showing in the artifact department, especially among the Lightners, so let's go through those first. Starting off, we have to talk about the Bone Turner's Tale. Seemingly an extended copy of the Canterbury Tales, this horrifying book contains descriptions of violent mutilation. Once mastered, the Lightner grants its user the ability to warp bone and muscle into more convenient forms, which Michael Crew found unhelpful, but Jared Hopworth really seemed to appreciate. Another notable book, this time owned by the Key family, is never given a proper title, but seems to be a small poetry book written in Sanskrit. It contains descriptions of dead animals, which could actually indicate ties to the end, but it can also summon twisted animal bones when passed through the shadows, which seems pretty fleshy. I'm not sure how often that ability would come in handy, but at least it's not banishing you to the void. An introduction to higher anatomy is a mysterious Leitner involved in the equally mysterious Yusuf case that made Jurgen Leitner a standout name for Basira and Daisy. We don't have anything to go on but the name, so I could see it belonging to the flesh or the stranger. Take your pick. There's also the book that ate Leitner Library Assistant Warren, which seems like the work of Viscera to me, although I could also see an argument for the hunt. On the item side of things, the clearest example is probably the meat grinder formerly owned by Mikhail Salesa's chef. Unlike most meat grinders, this one becomes less rusty with use, although the trade-off is that it'll probably encourage you to turn your limbs into tasty cuts of meat. As for other artifacts, I suppose you could include the duplicated items created by the Hans, which include Bibles, fingers, and I suppose the teeth from the bins of 93 Lancaster Road, even if I'm not sure exactly how much power they hold. Viscera may just have more locations than any other entity, though I'm too lazy to fact check that at the moment. Regardless, there's a lot, so let's get right into it. Hopworth's enterprises were quite successful, so there's no reason not to start there. In a seemingly innocuous butcher's shop, Jared did some work for the Ukrainian Mafia, chopping up those who disappointed them and feeding their parts to a small pit, which is probably significant, as we'll talk about later. From there, Jared went on to start up his very own gym, where he allowed bodybuilders to do whatever it takes to achieve their final form, even if that form isn't exactly what most people would consider human. 
John Han's Takeout Restaurant is a spot that you probably don't want to eat out of, both because there's a non-zero chance he's serving up his wife, and because of how it got broken down and vandalized, with the iconic Meat is Me sprayed onto it. While we're talking about the Hans, I have to mention that though the house on 93 Lancaster Road doesn't seem to be connected to the flesh, the rubbish bins outside are a different story. Also, there's the Slaughterhouse, which might have been a crossover with the Spiral given its maze-like structure, but the theme of meat production and repeated use of a paralyzing bolt gun makes it clear that the flesh had a role to play there as well. Finally, there's a Gnostic church in Istanbul, which we'll be going in depth on next. Referred to as the Last Feast, the only flesh ritual we know of was centered around an old Gnostic church located in Istanbul. During the ceremony, all sorts of creatures, both belonging to the flesh and accidentally roped into it, though not including Jared Hopworth, who seemed to not care for the rituals, were forced to carry meat to a pit in the basement of the church. Upon closer investigation, the pit was revealed to not just be a hole in the ground, but a massive maw, consuming the offering presented to it. For such a simple ritual, Gertrude Robinson figured out a simple solution. Explosives. Yeah, after eight years of research, Gertrude figured out that just blasting the ritual sky high did a pretty good job of handling it. There are four domains associated with the flesh, which is actually quite a lot as far as domains go. First off, of course, is Jared's Mortal Garden, which feeds on bodily insecurities and fears regarding body dysmorphia. The garden turns people into twisted flesh plants, growing out of the ground where their old bodies are buried. These plants give physical form to internal struggles, making for a haunting sight indeed. While Jared is alive, the garden is kept neat and clean, but is allowed to grow wild after John banishes its caretaker to the Shadow Realm. The processing line is up next being essentially a reversal of roles where humans are sent through an industrial meat plant. In the end, it feeds on the fears of insignificance and dehumanization felt by those trapped in its conveyor of death, as the meat harvested from them is deemed unusable and thrown away. It is ruled by some avatar, but we never meet them. St. Bleeding's Center for Wellbeing is definitely stranger-focused, given the presence of Dr. Jane Doe and the remaining half of Breakin and Hope living within its walls, but the actual acts performed seem to be very flesh-aligned. To feed off the fear of surgery, St. Bleeding's rips apart its patients in violent acts of torture over and over again, which feels pretty flesh to me. We'll come back to this in the next two sections because I do think it tells us something interesting about the flesh. Anyways, the final flesh domain is a nasty little space run by Angela. There's not much to it, really. Well, let's talk about the connective tissue holding the flesh to its other fear counterparts. First off, the flesh and the eye. Obviously, both of them have an affinity for extra body parts, with the eyes being very ocular in focus. But then there's Jared's attack on the Institute that, you know, happens entirely off-screen. While it was orchestrated by Elias slash Jonah, I think the viscera mess-up detail seemed a little too eager to take down a bastion of the eye for there not to be some bad blood present. In Mag 20, Desecrated Host, we see a lot of entities seemingly come together to ruin one priest's life, which I would guess probably means they're on speaking terms. This includes the web, spiral, and most importantly, the stranger. Before we talk about that though, let's talk about some thematically similar entities. The Desolation and the Dark both have strong religious ties, especially to churches, which gives some amount of parallel to the flesh's own semi-Christian imagery. The End has bones, which is about all I can say there. The Extinction definitely shares its man-made nature, and how they both rule over fears of people becoming something inhuman, which leads us quite nicely into what I believe is the most significant connection to the flesh, the stranger. So a while back, channel viewer 4 Kings suggested that I make a video creating a family tree of the fears, and that's an idea that's been brewing in my head for a while. Now, we know that the flesh is a fairly new fear, so if I had to bet, I'd say it sprung primarily from the stranger. First of all, both of them share a theme of transformation. In the works of I Do Not Know You, a person's transformation is centered around identity, while in Viscera's camp, the change is a lot more physical. 
Beyond that, though, they also deal in corruptions of the human appearance, and seem to use unhappiness about the self as a source of power. Basically, The Stranger is just the art major to the flesh's business major, and we're gonna move on before I have to think about whether or not that sentence made any sense. So, now we finally get to the part I enjoy, analyzing the entity. Obviously, I did sort of cut into this with my spiel about The Stranger and how it's quite similar to The Flesh, but I think there's still a lot to talk about. Like, for example, my ongoing storytelling allegory, which gets stretched thinner by the episode. This one was really difficult to figure out, but I think I'm happiest with the interpretation of The Flesh as a character's internal struggle. In writing, it's common advice to suggest that an author differentiate between a character's wants and a character's needs, and I think that the flesh can both show this, and how characters change and become dynamic, all in one. The flesh is all about change, be it the changing of living tissue into consumable meat, or the changing of a body into something more or less desirable. As a result, it's easy to see how physical changes can impact mental changes, and vice versa. The flesh's focus on self-improvement, even to the point of negative obsession, could represent how characters struggle to become who they really need to be. Thus, it represents the balance that has to be struck between a character's desires and what they actually need to be fulfilled. In its encouragement of unhealthy habits, the flesh can show what happens when an individual pushes forwards on the basis of what they want without actually understanding what will really make them happy. Something else that I've realized over the course of my research for this video is that the flesh seems to have a connection to duplication or production. Obviously, you have literal production lines and industrial farming, but you also have the Hans, who seem to be capable of spontaneously creating more of certain items, and the meat grinder, which produces more meat than the user sacrifices. I think this idea may come from a modern way of avoiding the fear generated by the flesh. Traditionally, in order to consume the flesh of an animal, the individual in question would have to actively harvest that meat, but ironically, by the time that the flesh would come into its own as an entity, that idea would already have begun to shrink. Now, because people can simply pick up meat from the refrigerators of a grocery store or have it sliced in a deli, there's less direct interaction with the mutilation process. It can be easy to feel that meat simply appears on shelves without actually considering the effort and fear that has to go into its acquisition, which might translate over into the flesh being able to do just that. In a very literal sense, it can make food simply appear out of nowhere. Also, if you want to lean more into the Christian theming of Viscera, it's interesting to note that the only miracle described in all four Gospels aside from the resurrection is the feeding of the 5,000, in which Jesus turns five loaves of bread and two fish into enough food to, as the name suggests, feed 5,000 people. Another aspect of the flesh which I find particularly interesting is how it ties into dehumanization. The flesh, at first, doesn't seem like a really psychological fear, being one of the most purely visceral, shock horror-based entities, but as you dig beneath the surface, there's actually a lot there that's worth uncovering. Near the surface, we find the flesh's ties to body dysmorphia, and feelings of discomfort in one's own skin. This is something expressed pretty commonly in flesh statements, especially in Mag90, Bodybuilder, and Mag171, The Gardener but I think it's worth bringing up because of how it shows us a major psychological aspect of Viscera's fear generation. It relies on feeling inadequate or below perfection. It relies on feeling as though you, as you are now, aren't good enough, ever stuck chasing an idea of perfect that does not and can never exist. It relies on feeling like you have to keep moving the goalpost to keep chasing a fantasy in an unwinnable race. These reliances build up to something massive, which is the existential horror of the flesh. Yes, the flesh is the fear of meat and butchery, but more than that, it's the fear that you are the meat. Not just the meat to be butchered, but that all you are, and all you ever will be, is a pile of muscle and sinew and bone. The flesh is entirely dependent on people being forced to confront that they might be nothing but electronic impulses rushing from grey skull porridge to receptors all over the body. It's also probably worth looking at how this contrasts with the religious elements of the flesh, 
but this has gotten quite long already, so I'll go ahead and cut it off here. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Entities Explained, and with it, our coverage of The Flesh. This is probably the most requested episode I've done yet, aside from maybe The Spiral, so I'm really happy to have been able to talk about it. I also have to say, I see why, because The Flesh is really interesting, and I think there's a lot more to say about it than I went over here. Anyways, as always, be sure to let me know if I missed anything. If you have any theories, if you disagree with my takes, or if you just want to say hi, all of which can be done in the comments down below. Once more, thank you guys so much for 1000 subs, and if you aren't a part of that number yet, hopefully this video has convinced you to join. Speaking of joining, grab that dark robe and candle, because next time we'll be looking deep into the lightless flame. Alright, I've been Afton Jeek here, and this has been Entities Explained. Good night, YouTube people.